Hello, back again with uh, some more material on the Z-transform. The other thing I want to talk about this evening is the region of convergence properties. And the region of convergence that we saw is the, the value sets of z where the z transform is well defined, usually because the, the infinite sum has to converge, an infinite geometric sum. Um, but there come a bunch of properties, important properties out of that. The first one is that there are uh, the, the ROC does not contain any poles. Right, and that makes sense because we've seen a pole is defined as a value of z where the z transform goes to infinity well, if the z transform is going to infinity it's not converging there so it can't be in the region of convergence because it isn't convergent at that z sort of comes from the name the second point that's important for the z transform is the border of the region of convergence is always a circle that falls at a pole. So while it, the RC may not contain any poles, the, the poles sort of form the boundary, or maybe the fence post, if you will, that holds it up. So that means if I draw the complex plane, I could have an ROC that's like this inside a circle, could have another ROC like this outside a circle for magnitude of z bigger than something, magnitude of z uh, less than something. I could have an ROC that looks like a donut or a bagel or a torus, if you will. It's not a very well drawn one. But basically, it can be in between two values of z. The magnitude of z can be more than it, some value and less than the other. These are all valid ROCs. Uh, this one gets maybe a little complicated, but one I cannot have. I cannot have an ROC that looks like this. I can't have two disjoint rings. It turns out there's, there's no way you can have an ROC maybe that looks like this with, with a spot in the middle and an eyeball. So yeah, you can't have the eyeball ROC. This ROC is right out. It can never look like this. It has to be a connected region and it has to have circular boundaries. So it can be a disk, it can be sort of the opposite of a disk going out, or it can be a ring. It can't be like that. Or it can be, we'll see in a minute, nearly the entire z-plane is also a possibility for certain signals. Uh, the other important properties have to do with, with we can actually predict where the ROC will be based on the types of signal. For instance, third ROC property, if X of N is right-sided, so there's a signal that is zero for a while, right, and then sort of drawing a cartoon signal here, a zero up to some point and then turns on. So maybe this is some N1 here. So it, it's, uh, saying it's right-sided means that X of N equals zero before some point. If I have a signal that looks like this, the ROC goes outwards from the largest finite pole. Sort of related one is that if x of n is left-sided, so that's something that's just the opposite, right? Maybe it, it, it's something that looks like this, so it's zero or non-zero before some n1. It may be dying off or growing, it doesn't really matter. This says that x of n equals zero for n greater than n1. 
this tells me the ROC goes inwards from the uh, smallest non-zero pole. And the fifth uh, important property is that if x of n, or whatever the sequence is, is absolutely summable, the ROC includes the unit circle. Right, which we sometimes can also say the unit circle is the set of points where the magnitude of z equals 1. And this fifth one isn't too surprising if we stop and think for a few minutes. Because we're saying if we know if x of n is absolutely summable, that was one of the conditions for the Fourier transform existing. And we also know that the z transform evaluated on the unit circle gives us the Fourier transform. So if x of n is absolutely summable, it has a Fourier transform, so that unit circle has to be inside the ROC so that I can evaluate the z-transform there to get the same thing. So there's actually sort of a, a, a three-way connection here. Let me uh, scroll up just a little and put that on. So three equivalent conditions for this is that saying something is absolutely summable is equivalent to saying the Fourier transform, the discrete time Fourier transform exists which is also equivalent to saying the ROC includes the unit circle as we just said. So those are all three equivalent things and it's also equivalent to saying if it's a system function, if it's H of Z that it's a stable system. And if, if, it's, if, if we're talking about H of Z, then this is also equivalent to saying the system is stable. So Z transform makes it very easy to tell when the system is stable or not. Just look at the unit circle. A final sort of related point about Z transforms, or maybe about ROCs, it's always worth re reminding you, is that the number of poles has to equal the number of zeros. Although some may be at infinity, so Z equals infinity, that's that wasn't elegantly done. Let me fix that. So some will be at... If I look on the finite z-point and the number of poles are not equal to the number of zeros, that means there's some hiding at infinity. And those, those will, as we get more practice working with the z-transform, see what that means. So let me finish up sort of summarizing some of this uh, with a, a chart I've drawn sometimes. That it's helpful to sort of lay these out in cartoon form some people, especially if you're a visual thinker, people find it easier to help remind them of this. So let's make sort of a, a table with some, some graphs here. We have three columns. The left-hand thing is what kind of signal is it? The next thing is what's the time domain sort of silhouette or cartoon of the signal looks like. And then the last piece is, what does the ROC look like? So how these are all linked together. So mostly this is just filling in the things we just saw. So for example, if the signal is right-sided, right, that means, as, as we just said, the cartoon may look sort of like this. Right, A signal at zero for a while, and then it turns on, and it may die off or grow again. And we said this means the ROC is outside the largest finite pole. So if I maybe make a uh, sort of toy version of this, maybe I'll have this point here and 
pole there and another pole over here. And maybe both of them are inside the unit circle. So here's my, my, my lens. It really looks like more like a unit circle, but we'll pretend it's a unit oval. I say unit circle, even though it looks like an oval, but we'll pretend it's a circle. So if it's right sided, the ROC, actually here we can be fancy since I have colors, the ROC will be from here out, right here are my poles. Turns out, well, and the way I've drawn it here, there, there is no clearly larger one. They're both the same radius. But we know the ROC is outside the largest finite pole, which would look like this. Right? The other option, well, the next option we talked about was left-sided. Right? So that's a sequence which goes on in negative time. Maybe... You know, maybe it's it's actually can it actually even be blowing up and then it turns off for some point after that. So again, this is the time domain. This is my x of n. Should have labeled it better. And this is my imaginary plane. So this is real. And this is the imaginary axis. If I draw those again, say well now I may have a couple poles. Let me make them not equal to make it a little more clear what I mean. So this one's a little further in. So the ROC here will be inside the radius of the smallest finite pole. And actually it turns out I could argue in this version that in fact the unit circle has to be out here. The ROC is not including the unit circle but inside it because this thing is blowing up. So it's not going to be absolutely summable. So this can't be a stable sequence. It wouldn't have a Fourier transform so to sort of be internally consistent. The main, but the main point is that, again, the ROC is inside, for left-sided sequences, inside the smallest pole. So if we keep uh, building our table as we go up here, the other possibility is that the sequence can actually be two-sided. So imagine I had a, a, a signal that, again, this is my n-axis, and it's dying off in both directions. Maybe not even with the same decay constant. But it's not zero anywhere. It goes in both directions forever, maybe dying off. This is actually what will give me an ROC that is ring shaped. So I'll have a maybe I'd have a pole inside, a pole outside. And the poles don't actually always have to be real. I, I realize I'm just drawing them all that way in the example. They don't even always have to be positive either. But in this case, my ROC would be the ring in between these two lines. So again, it satisfies the properties we've seen, that all the boundaries are circles. There are no poles inside it, but these two poles are sort of forming the fences that, that put the limits of the ROC. The ROC would be, you know, in this case, if we call this point, this one here is A, and this one is B, we'd say that we have A is less than magnitude Z, less than B. And maybe it's worth backing up and doing that up here. See, if this one was A, this one would be, we'd have magnitude of z inside, I guess actually if this is a, it's a negative number, so we'd want to make, it's, it's a radius, so that would have to be magnitude also. And backing up to my first example, and these would both have, be radius a, but if that was a there, so I'd say the ROC here would be magnitude of z greater than a. Right, so here's, right-sided means that z is bigger than something, for the region of convergence. Left-sided means Z goes inside something. Two-sided means it's a ring between two poles. And then the last option we haven't talked about is something that's both right-sided and left-sided after a fashion. Oops, that should have been a white line to keep consistent. Which is the fourth and final case we'll mention is the finite length. Right, so my cartoon for that would be something that's zero for a while, and then it turns on and zig zigs around. And again, these are all actually really discrete. We're just sort of drawing a silhouette to, to carry the important information, which is where is it zero or not. And then in this case, the ROC for a finite length thing will be all the z-plane except maybe z equals zero or z equals infinity. So for a finite length signal, the only poles can be z equals zero or z equals infinity. 
And that sort of makes sense if we remember the definition of the Z-transform. Let me scroll up and just sort of tuck it in here at the bottom. Remember we said that x of z equals the sum as n goes from minus n, minus infinity to plus infinity of x of n, z of minus n. And if there are only a finite number of non-zero x's here, this sum only has a finite number of terms. So a finite sum of finite terms has to be finite or converge. So the only way this thing can blow up is for positive values of n, this will be z to the minus n when z equals zero. So this will be one over z to the sum power, and when z equals zero, that blows up. Or if for negative values of n, this when z goes to infinity, this will be z to some positive n, and it will blow up. Those are the only ways to make this sum blow up if it only has a finite number of terms, is you need to make one of the one or more of the terms infinite. Okay, so we've seen some important properties of this the region of convergence for the Z transform, and some little cartoon sketches that some people find, some people in the past have found that helpful to keep straight. How does the, looking at the signal in the time domain tell me something about its region of convergence? Okie doke. See, talk to you next time.